Hello and welcome to TFN Live at the Fundraising Scotland Conference. I'm here today with Daniel Flosky. Daniel is the Head of Policy and Research at the Institute of Fundraising and he is speaking this afternoon in a session with Sense Scotland Chief Executive Andy Kerr. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Um, do you want to start off just tell me a wee bit about what your role is at the ILA? Sure, so I'm Head of Policy and Research and in the main that basically means the work that I do is talking to our members, understanding what their needs, priorities are and thinking about what the Institute wants to say as an organisation to government or to other stakeholders on behalf of fundraisers. And I understand your event this afternoon is going to be focusing on trustees. Can you tell me a bit about your event and who it's aimed at and why people might want to come along? Sure. So, yeah, the session is around trustees and their role in fundraising. I think it's something which has kind of been quite prominent over the last year, 18 months or so, uh, in terms of issues around fundraising practice, governance, oversight, the role of that trustee in terms of how they put together a fundraising strategy, their role of putting together a team, making sure that the work with fundraising team and operation is working really well. Um, I think you probably saw some examples last year of what happens when that relationship doesn't go so well and some trustees being kind of open to say we weren't aware that this was happening, maybe we haven't given enough oversight and thought about this. So what we've been doing at the Institute over the last um, over the last time really is thinking about how we can help trustees do do that role well. It's a hard yeah. role, they're volunteers. Um, but there's some guidance that we're uh, going to be publishing next week, which is a handbook with other organisations trying to help trustees understand what their roles and responsibilities are and quite a practical approach about how they can take that back to their organisation and help them support their fundraising teams. One of the things that came up in the fundraising reviews last year, and I touched on a wee bit there, was that uh, a lot of fun, um, a lot of trustees, sorry, they didn't really have feel they had sufficient involvement in fundraising yeah. campaigns right from the start, so they maybe didn't quite know what was going on with the campaigns. Can, is that something you recognise, or as as a way to kind of try and combat that problem? Sure. I mean, I think it's you know every trustee and every trustee board will be will be different from each other especially when you've got you know, a sector which has got hugely different, diverse kind of organisations. So you wouldn't want to kind of uh, have a complete generalisation. But I think probably over the last year, lots of boards have actually been asking themselves the questions, are we doing this well? Should we be doing things better? And that's fine. You know, you can ask those questions and think, actually, no, we're doing, we're doing all right. But the key thing is to make sure that you've got some time to reflect, check what you're doing and look at how you can maybe do a better job if you need to about overseeing that fundraising team. You of course need to get a balance, you know, you don't necessarily want every trustee signing off every email that comes out looking at every single letter, but they need to be aware of the process, how the organisation is fundraising, and of course, you know, setting and just directing a fundraising strategy that can put in place the kind of things that enable that charity to grow and to remain sustainable in the future. Um, do you think trustees appreciate that they carry a kind of ultimate responsibility when it comes to ensuring charities comply to the law? And, and likewise, do you think fundraisers have got that understanding as well? Um, I think trustees probably have got that overall understanding of their, their role as a trustee. I wonder whether it maybe hasn't been quite as clear and consistent and prominent enough about what that means in relation to fundraising. So I think every, you know, every trustee will be looking at annual accounts and they'll be looking at what's coming in and what's going out. But maybe what they haven't looked at in quite as much depth or detail is well, what are those actual activities that are bringing in that role. If the only question you are asking as a trustee is, are we to target, then you're missing something. You've got to look at how are we doing this? Is it the kind of fundraising that our organisation wants to be doing, the values of our charity? How are we approaching donors? That, those kind of conversations and questions need to be had. And you yourself are a trustee at the Children's Hospice Charity here in House. Yes, that's right. Um, so how important from your personal perspective is it that funders have good relationships with the board then so they can really work together? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really important. It's been fascinating being a trustee and kind of seeing it from, from the other side. Um, we've got, I think, a really good relationship and working kind of relationship with our fundraising team. I think one of the things that um, trustees need to do is be present and that doesn't just mean going to the trustee board meeting but that means going out you know, having time to meet with the fundraisers meet with the team understand what they're doing um, we've also got a kind of income generation subcommittee so there's a group of three or four trustees who work with the fundraising director and that does a bit more of the kind of 
hands-on stuff means that the board doesn't have to spend every board meeting going through it, but the board can be satisfied that, yes, a group of trustees are coming together and working at it. Um, that's a model that works for us and I think has really helped to get a really good relationship between the fundraisers, fundraising team and the trustees. But it's not quite a one-size-fits-all model. There might be different things that work for different charities. And part of your role at IOF, I believe, is to keep up to date with members' priorities. Yeah. As a, a lot of kind of trends, similar priorities come up just now, is there one or two that you think will maybe be quite important over the next year? Or? Yeah, I mean, you could probably ask that question to any fundraiser and you'd probably get different a different answer. answer. Um, but yeah, I think there probably are some kind of general trends or common themes. Um, certainly, people are probably going to be coming to grips with a changing regulatory system. And obviously, there's a different regulatory system in terms of fundraising developing in Scotland than there is in England and Wales potentially in Northern Ireland as well. So wherever you are and whichever charity you're working for, you're probably going to be looking around just checking exactly what's going on. Um, so I think, and from our point of view as the professional membership body, one of the key things is really trying to help fundraisers be up to date with you know, any legal changes, what the regulatory system is, because we want to make sure that people are confident about how they're going about their activity. Um, I mean, some of the other kind of common themes, I guess, that are coming up is you know, they're Brexit is having quite a number of conversations across the sector about what that will mean and how it might affect different charities. Are people scared of Brexit? Um, I think that people are, well, uncertain as much as anything, and obviously uncertainty brings its own kind of worries in terms of planning and strategy. Um, my feeling tends to be that I think the immediate stuff around Brexit is about how it affects the economy because the biggest thing that impacts on charities is the economic situation and context you're working in. So if suddenly um, you know, your costs are going up or VAT goes up or something like that or the cost of delivering your services goes up then that's going to have a real impact on how charities operate. Um, I think one thing that we've seen kind of through the kind of previous recession and, um, is that actually giving from the public is incredibly kind of loyal. People do give and continue to support the charities they care about, which is a really you know, great message to have. Obviously, we're not complacent about that, but it's really good to see that people do still support charities even when their times are challenging. Um, so I think it's the wider economic context that's mainly affecting people. But who knows? You know, Brexit could have an, a, an impact on anything from uh, your workforce, from your services that you deliver, to how you work with government, so on and so forth. So it could manifest itself in lots of different ways. The main thing that we're trying to do at the moment is identify what those key things are and make sure that we're having the conversations with government and with the right people to make sure that they understand what the needs and priorities of charities are. So that's all we've got time for us now. Just uh, thank you much for joining us, Daniel. Oh, it's great. Thanks.